So I'd like to invite Sam Altman and Roloff Botha up on stage, please. Thank you guys for being here. So we're going to talk about where we are in the private tech markets. And it's a theme that's come up a couple different times today. Um, I asked Dustin on stage, and he said that yeah, I should ask you, not him. So um, <laughs> but um, I thought I'd start just with a where are we at? Where, where are we? What's the mood? What's going on? High level stuff. Roll off. Tempered. Tempered, OK. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a sense in which the, the big companies are accumulating more power, candidly similar to what I felt happened in 2002, 2003. Before broadband and before smartphones took off, you know, people were looking for the next new thing. And the big companies, you know, in a period like that, it's not as though innovation stops, it's just that the innovation happens largely in big companies. And I feel the same is happening again today. And that's why a lot of the conversation amongst the tech community is, what are some of those new waves? Because new waves create disruption that unfairly favors the startup. And that might be autonomous vehicles, it might be machine learning, it might be AI, you know, some, something is gonna blossom from one of those categories. So tempered because there's a sense that the opportunities for startups may be somewhat more bounded or limited than... Well, I think that what happened in the early days of broadband, again, is, you know, most legacy companies, you know, for them, broadband was a new thing, so they didn't pay attention to it. Similarly, even a company like Microsoft that had great earnings yesterday, they were slow to get to smartphones because mm. initially smartphones have a million sockets. So why, why do they care? They've got a billion PCs to target. And in the early days of smartphones, uh, I likened it to a game of musical chairs. Uh, everybody's trying to grab a seat, but at this point, the music stopped. Smartphone penetration is 70% and flat. Mm. It's not growing anymore. And so now and again, you get a Snapchat that I think invents a new seat and they, get a <laughs> they find a, you know, a place at the table. But at this point, it's very hard for new people to gain a foothold in, uh, in the smartphone mm. ecosystem, for example. So Sam, you see a, more startups than most people. Has the music stopped for startups? Well, I have a specific answer and a general one. The, the specific one is that I think it's always hard to say, has the music stopped for startups? Are startups overpriced? Because it is always about a particular investment and not, not the general thing. Like when people say, well, you know, valuations for Series A rounds are too high as a general statement. I, I understand the underlying belief there, which is that everything is overheated. Um, but I think there are always really good investments to make. Um, at Y Combinator, we don't move our terms up or down in good times or bad times. We always just stay at the same terms. So we're where we were three years ago, seven years ago, and I think we'll be in the same, roughly the same terms uh, adjusted for inflation in terms of the dollars that we give a few years from now. Um, the, I think a point that Roloff made, though, is really good, which is that the, the startups that you want are the most disruptive ones that are surfing these giant changes. And I think what people are sensing but not correctly articulating is that maybe we just have less giant changes happening right now mm -hmm. than we did in 2009, 2010. I believe there are new things on the horizon, and I believe there are going to be startups started in the next couple of years in machine learning and synthetic bio that look incredibly cheap in retrospect but are decried as incredibly expensive at the time the investments are made. Um, when someone says an investment is really overpriced, they're usually either really right or really wrong. And I, I believe we're going to see that with this next set of companies. The, but we're not there. I mean, those platforms, those No, I think they're now, I think they're now absolutely coming. Mm -hmm. And I think most investors are too lazy to learn about new areas. Mm -hmm. And so they're still looking at mobile apps and saying, well, you know, I'm tired of these. But they're not doing the work to get up to speed on new things. My, my general answer, though, is there is a bubble. There is a... A and um, because of, well, I don't know why people aren't paying attention, but for whatever reason, people are transferring the interest rate bubble to the startup bubble. And the trick when you say an asset class is overpriced is that there's always a denominator. It's, it's always, I would rather hold US dollars or startup equity, and here's what I think the relative value is. And, and I think that, yeah, I think the zero interest rates thing is going to end really badly. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's unique to startups. And I would not short startups against like the S&P or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about, I mean, in sort of a more micro-ish level, I mean, there was a period earlier this year where things did feel a little more grim, right? I mean, companies, uh, you know, had much tougher time. Yeah, you know, the, there was a 
people have been desperately wanting to be right about calling the crash for so long that in January and February, <laughs> when it looked, it. <laughs> you know, when it looked like the S and P yeah. rolled over in the first few weeks of the year, uh, there was a lot of like crowing about. Mm -hmm. I told you all, you know, like it's all going to crash. These startups are all completely fucked. Like the world's going to end. Um, and then, like, you know, it made a new high not that much later, and people were back to saying, this startup thing is going to go forever. This is real. That, you know, um, and they raised a lot of money. Everyone, like, courted their cash, right? So I think, like, one good answer is to try not to day trade startups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do people try to day trade startups? At least in what they say. Yeah. No, but there are a lot of the tourists. The media does. The media does. The media does, and there are a lot of tourists. Yeah. But there's a lot of tourist tourists? money that came into the valley in 99, there's a lot of tourist money that's been in the valley again the last few years. And I think those people go away when the tide goes out. Well, al although I think this is, I don't think they go away until the real problem with interest rates gets solved. Agreed. Uh, and so I don't have a story for how that's gonna end. Um, but I, I think that people, the reason that people have been so wrong for so long about calling the end is because there's this massive counterweighting thing of you can't get a return on capital in any risk-free way. And so it has been flooding into any, just sloshing around looking for anywhere it can maybe get a return. And you see things like people who normally would leave after their first few investments didn't work, desperate to put cash somewhere. You see SoftBank with $100 billion. How, how are they gonna put $100 billion into startups? What does that mean, both of you guys are VC? What do you, yeah, what does that make you think? Hundred billion. I mean. What was your reaction to that news? The cycle is not over yet. <laughs> <It's> not <laughs> over. Hey, this will be an environment unlike others. I don't think there's a single point you know, that will mark a, a crash or a correction like what we had in 2000 or in 2008. I think you're absolutely right. It, it'll be gradual. Unicorns, former unicorns will slowly die. You know, meltdown will slowly happen. And there'll be a, a rebirth of some other really new interesting companies. So. Are the metrics you're looking for and the benchmarks you're looking for companies at different phases changing? I mean, have they gotten more stringent as, um, I, just because of the environment? You know, I um, feel a little bad that I fell for, I pride myself on like not falling for stupid things that other people say, but I did earlier this year and I got a little bit panicked. And I told all the YC startups that they should really try to get profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and they did, and I told was them it was going to be. Bill Gurley's post, perhaps. That maybe one of yours. I don't know. <laughs> um, the no, I, I, you know, I, again, Bill Gurley will be right someday. It's it's easy to call a crash. It's very hard to call the timing. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, um, <laughs> that it takes more intelligence than I have. Um, the but I did kind of get caught up, and I was like, it does feel ex ante a little bit ridiculous right now. Um, and I don't think I fully Why understand. Why is that so bad, though? Is it be, I mean, in the sense that, like, is it because maybe they've, they've sacrificed some short-term growth by making that trade? Well, no, the danger is that I told a bunch of startups that they should raise more money and take more dilution earlier on than they normally would or that I would normally advise because of longer-term risk. And I didn't really believe it, but I got caught up in it and said it anyway, and that was probably a little bit bad, but it's at least a safe direction to be wrong in. I think what we're looking for though, and what Y Combinator, sometimes to our detriment, always tries to look for, is companies that can get profitable if they need to without being dependent on outside investors. So we're always excited for companies to raise money and spend it to grow faster and get bigger more quickly. Um, but we like companies that aren't dependent on that because then you really are at the whims of public sentiment. Mm -hmm. Or one notch back from that is to have provable unit economics, mm -hmm. either as a consumer business or even as an enterprise business where you can grow slower, cut back on sales and marketing, and maybe not quite reach profitability, but it's clear to an investor they can analyze and understand that there's a business there. And so have you guys, have you changed when you're looking at investments? Does unit economics become a more important, um, because like the, you know, the ride sharing industry still has horrendous unit economics, right? But still maybe a good investment. So how do you balance what you're looking for now? It probably matters more for the, I mean, you have a growth fund as well. It probably matters more for the later stage investments mm -hmm. because if you're dependent on that next 100 million that you may need to raise 12 months from now, if you're just growing at all cost, that's a very dangerous game to play. Like you, I, don't, you don't want to break into a corner. <laughs> 
this, I think, actually is the key point in terms of what people have been getting wrong this cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote maybe a year or a year and a quarter ago, I wrote this post called Unit Economics. And it was about how the thing that people are getting wrong is that they have these businesses that are growing, but without a miracle or a change, will never make money. And I posted it like I post any other thing without a lot of thought and went to bed. And I woke up the next morning with like 100 emails from YC founders saying, I need to meet you urgently. <laughs> um, we're never going to work. And I, I didn't, until that experience, have a sense for how many companies were making this mistake. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, that has been the special signature of what's gone wrong this cycle. Well, how did we get into a place where that just was thrown out the window? There's a flood of money. Yeah. It gets back to the interest rate environment that Sam talked about. Yeah. I mean, it, it's human condition, right? If the money is there, you just, you know, just it, it, it's like having the exam date postponed by a week. You don't magically study a week longer, you just study later. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing, when the money's in your pocket, you just delay. The, the really one thing on. I would add as a consequence of that is because there's so much money available and because so many of these businesses don't have, or at least at the early days, don't have an obvious network effect or competitive advantage, you got into these crazy price wars where you're doing this service, it kind of like makes a little bit of money, but then a competitor of yours raises $50 million and cuts prices to a place where they're losing money. So you cut lower, yeah. and now the consumers have lower and lower expectations. And you can reverse that, but it's hard. Um, but that's a consequence of relatively undifferentiated businesses and huge amounts of available capital. Mm -hmm. And in China, those businesses just merge. Or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but that, I mean, in here, one, yeah, it's a very different market. Um, Looking at the really big tech companies, the fangs, if you will, the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Did I miss one? Is there an S? Missing Apple and Microsoft. Apple and Microsoft, OK. So we need a new acronym, if anyone has a new acronym. Yeah. Um, which and, ones? And BAT in China. Yeah. That's outdated, I think, too. But uh, which ones are you most optimistic about? Which ones are you most pessimistic about? Roloff is probably a much better growth investor <laughs> than I am. <laughs> uh, I think that either Amazon or Google has a shot of being the first trillion dollar company. Mm -hmm. I think the Amazon, partly for its momentum in retail e-commerce, I mean, they have consistently grown faster than e-commerce as a whole. And if you look at the internet retailer top 100 e-commerce companies, Amazon has consistently grown faster than any of them, despite being the largest. Mm -hmm. So there are these incredible you know, economies of scale and scope that they have as a business. And then their cloud offering is by far the market leader today. So I think they have an incredibly good shot. Google obviously has its tentacles in many interesting businesses. Um, maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid having listened to Diane Green last week. But I think Google Cloud is they are really serious about it. And they're going to make a serious go of the cloud computing business. And Google can leverage capabilities that Amazon may not have. I think they have much better machine learning and AI capabilities at Google that may end up being really interesting value-added services that propel their cloud business. So those are the two that I would I'd be most enthusiastic about. Mm -hmm. Look, I generally don't hold, I usually sell public shares when I get them because I don't like having to watch the numbers tick up and down every day and stress out about <laughs> if I should hold or sell or Just whatever. It. It's hard to do. <laughs> um, but, but what I would say and this is from a completely uneducated point, not having looked at any of these companies' financials in detail. Um, my intuition is there's not a single one of them. Back to this idea that there's always a denominator. There's not a single one of them I'd be willing to short against the S&P. Hmm. Why? Because I think they're all not overvalued relative to other companies, mm -hmm. or re relative to equities right. in general. Um. IPO market. So we're hearing a lot of buzz that 2017 might be the year that these decacorns finally hit the markets. And um, there's actually a lot of evidence that it will. Snapchat's getting ready. Others are as well. Um, what do you see about the, from just when it comes to companies getting ready to IPOs and thinking about timing? Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be a sort of moment in time in 2017 where it's going to be that much better. I mean, there've been some very successful IPOs already this year. I think there will be a few more. Um, successful pre-lockup, right? Are you mean true? Be, yeah, true. <laughs> <You're saying. laughs> details, details. details. <laughs> you know. um, I think you will see a handful, but I don't think it's, it's suddenly going to be a flood uh, in 2017. I, I think many of these companies, because of the interest rate environment, may end up with an ability to raise money privately at 
IPO level pricing mm -hmm. without the attendant negatives of being a public company. And so, you know, hard to predict. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that my prediction is that we will see some, short of a macro collapse, we will see some very significant IPOs next year. Um, the, and I think that there are advantages to being public and advantages to being private, and it's hard to say in general if going public is better or worse than staying private. Uh, I, I think it really depends on the specific company. My one um, controversial thought on this, everyone talks about the liquidity premium mm -hmm. and that you, know, you should go public because there's this idea of a liquidity premium, a company's worth more if it's liquid. Uh, and my, my, my controversial thought on this is actually that in the current environment for a long list of reasons, there's an illiquidity premium. And that given all of the, I think, things that are broken about being public right now, uh, if you're trying to do something that the market is not going to like, at, or at least mm -hmm. misunderstand in the short term, uh, there can be plenty of good reasons to stay private. And maybe that's worth more in some cases, and you should yeah. prefer that. Mm -hmm. Or the entrepreneurs who I point that out to say, well, well Bezos gets away with you know, being public and not worrying about being profitable or shifting a strategy. And there but are, he, but he earned it. I mean, yeah, I that's mean, what I said. Amazon yeah. today is eight hundred dollars a share. People forget that you know, at one point it traded at six. He yeah, was six. beaten down for a long time, <laughs> and I bet if you asked him about that, he would say it was at least somewhat painful. Yeah. Um, there are a no You can get away with it if you are, if you get yourself to the point where you are one of the tech mega caps, uh, and then you can led by a strong founder uh, who is willing to be misunderstood by Wall Street for a long period of time. But most founders I know, unfortunately, are far more affected by their upgrades and downgrades and stock price and analysts than you would like to believe. Uh, and if you don't get to that escape velocity of being one of these giant companies the mutual funds have to own, I think that can be tough. Mm -hmm. Roloff, was being going public good for Square, do you think? I mean, it's sort of like a random question. <laughs> what a loaded question. No, uh, it doesn't mean to be, but in the sense of just, you know, I mean, it's one of the ones that more recently than others, did, you know, did decide to do that. So. I think it was a good decision, and I'm, I'm glad we, we swallowed our pride and took an IPO price that was lower than the last mm -hmm. private valuation we had um, and proceeded, I think. As a financial services firm, there's so much inside the company that's run like a public company anyway because you're subject to scrutiny from state regulators, and so the additional burden of being public is not actually that much more. Um, and it leg legitimizes the company in many respects. Mm -hmm. Part of the calculus is that people were saying so many things about the company from the outside that were off, you know, yeah. that missed the mark because they didn't have the data. And part of what we felt is let's just get the data out there and then people can judge for themselves. Yeah. You can always just give it to us, and we'll put it out there, too. <laughs> Saves you the challenge of going public, if that's the rationale. But, um, Some the, companies are actually thinking about doing that, by the way. Oh, it definitely it happens all the time. I mean, I think that the, uh, I mean, I remember years ago, um, before Facebook IPO'd, I mean, there was this period when all of a sudden the company pretty openly started talking yeah. about revenue, you know? And, um, you know, Uber has monthly conference calls with all its investors, and or quarterly conference calls with all its investors, and there are enough of them that that's essentially Big telling bubble. the world, you yeah. know. Um, I wanted to circle back just to the, you mentioned you think there's still late stage capital that could be available to these companies. Um, wh where are the private equity firms and the hedge funds, you know, um, kind of in their appetite for those rounds? And uh, in the context of, you know, they've systematically been slashing their prices and marking them down. I think that category is, they may still be interested, but I think they're a lot less sought after by the companies. Mm -hmm. and, but there's always more, whether it's SoftBank, I think it's Baidu that just launched the 25 yeah. or $30 billion fund last week. So there's, you know, whether it's the Saudis, there's, there's always someone else, it seems, that's ready to step in to do late stage financing. But the appetite for a late stage private company in our portfolio to take one of the mutual funds that's you know, going public without going public because, you know, they talk about the company's results, they slash the, the holding value, massive impact on morale inside the company, CEOs trying to explain, no, we are, are actually doing well, these guys, I mean, it's a nightmare. So I, I think the reason that you're seeing the slowdown from the Fidelities or TPGs or anyone that marks values is not because they don't want to keep writing checks, it's the companies will no longer take them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I think is that they, just because they don't want that valuation being out there, or is there more to it? Well, in many cases, there's that was not nearly the worst of the behavior, but that that definitely has an effect, especially when it's a company acting with very imperfect information that is making a public statement. Mm -hmm. It's not a market, right? Because it's not a lot of people saying, "Here's what we yeah. think the prices." It's yeah. one person with imperfect data saying, "Here's this random thing." Um, so I, I think. My working model for a lot of the late stage capital has been it's more like debt than equity, but there are some caveats to that, and that causes you know, you know, an investor portfolio manager to be willing to agree to one set of terms, even if then an accountant says, well, if I look at this as equity and ignore those terms because these things could happen, I value it at this. But in any case, what we have seen among our companies is a very... Um, healthy market at the early stage, a very healthy market at the super late stage, a Stripe, an Airbnb, mm -hmm. something like that, and a less investors playing in the kind of call it 300 million to 2 billion valuation range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, mm -hmm. how, what do you think will be the consequences of that? Well, by less of a market, the good companies are all still raising money on terms that I think are outstanding. So I don't, I don't think we're yet at a place where I would say the word consequences. Mm -hmm. So, okay. No one's going out of business yet. You know, the... Uh, the no company's going out of business. <laughs> there are not enough. Like, the, the sign of it, people say, well, these unicorns are going to die. This market is really broken. The sign of an unhealthy market is if no unicorns are dying, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be healthier um, to see more companies dying. And, you know, I make fun of people that have been calling for the deaths of the unicorns for years. But... I would like to see some. I think it'd be health. Like, it's weird to me. Do that you keep track at YC of like um, failure rate? I think. We do. We do. Uh, it, this is like well? a constant thing. I beat the drum on. It's not high enough. Mm. Um, something is wrong in the way we are doing things. Either we are turning down good companies or companies we should be funding because we're, we're just we don't have enough scale. We are not taking enough risk and we're missing the companies that could be really huge. I don't know what the problem is, but I do know at the stage we fund companies we should have a much higher than 20% failure rate. And it's about 20%? About. And how many years out do you try? Like, is that within? Five-ish, maybe. I mean, it's yeah. hard for us to say we can have data more than that, just how long we've been around and how long this takes. And the key is that the talent is not redeployed to a better use. Yeah. That you have somebody who can get another round of funding and they spend two or three more years doing something that doesn't ultimately lead anywhere, and maybe they should have started another company, maybe they should have joined another endeavor and helped something else succeed, and that's, that's the challenge. But failure is a sign of health. Some companies failing is a sign of health, not, it's the opposite of that that's the problem. Yeah. Um, so how, I can't remember how long it was that you guys announced your new sort of follow-on fund for YC, a year ago, more than a year? Yeah, like, oh, I think it was October of last year. So, so how's it going? Uh, I'll tell you in nine more years. <laughs> I, I, I mean, okay. it's really hard to say. Have you made investments? We or? have. Um, you know, we made maybe five big investments uh -huh. plus dozens of pro -ratas. I feel good looking today, but uh, you know, the good news and the bad news is I don't have to think about it, or I can't really have a strong opinion about it for a long time. And how, um, maybe this is a question for Roloff, but what does the rest of the VC world think about, you know, YC doing more investing up the chain? You can say whatever chain. you really think. <laughs> <laughs> it's rational for them to do that. I mean, it's an opportunity. I mean, we have a growth fund. Mm -hmm. You know, when we make... But the idea is, like, they have an unfair advantage because they're picking the... I mean, I'm just speaking, like, what some So we have an unfair VCs advantage because we have a venture fund and then we yeah. make some growth investments. And we get it wrong many times, too, by the way, in our companies that we should have made a growth investment in and we, we failed to do so. So, you know, I don't think it's fair to say we can do it, but they can't do it. I mean, it's all square in love and war. No, not war. This is not war. war. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's completely rational for them to do that. They've known these companies from the earliest yeah. days, and if there's an interesting opportunity to support them in a follow-on financing, it's not for me to judge. I think, you know, at the margin, does it mean that maybe is an opportunity that we couldn't pursue or some other firm? Yeah, but I mean, that's called competition, and it's good for the ecosystem. I think it, Would you want to go even earlier? Better. Like, I mean, you guys do go pretty early, it's, but like, I mean, it seems like we're seeing the blurring of classes of... Yeah, but it's hard. So we have 11 investment partners in the venture business in the U.S., and we have an approach of partnering, you know, very directly with the company to help them do company building. We take board seats. I've been on some boards for over a decade. I show up every month, every two months, you know, 
And we help these companies recruit, go, you know, deal with the strategy. And it's very, you know, we just think about it, it's very time intensive. Mm -hmm. We can't scale that to a very large number of companies. And so our business is about partnering with 15 to 20 companies a year, and we can't really change that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think, I don't think we should. It's well, not it's working model. very well for you guys. I mean, you still have amazing companies no, and amazing do. returns. So. Can I say something about our growth fund? Yes, please. I, the thing that really excites me about it is, well, I don't even think, like probably, honestly, YC goes up head to head against Sequoia for a growth deal. Hard maybe to see us winning that unless we're willing to pay a lot more. I, I mean, uh, we will sometimes, but I wouldn't say we're going to do that every time. The thing I'm most excited about and the thing that I think when people look back will say they're happy YC did that, we fund a lot of companies that look um, deeply unpopular to the current investment climate uh, that require huge amounts of capital. Like what? Nuclear fusion companies, quantum computing companies, synthetic biology, rockets, supersonic airplanes. And my biggest criticism of the Silicon Valley investment environment is that people don't think critically enough about unpopular sectors that are important to the world and also phenomenal investment opportunities. And I realized, or, or it's just not their sweet spot. It's not what they've been doing. It's not what yeah. they're really good at. Um, and because it works so well, there's no need to get really good at it. Um, but it's really important to me personally that YC fund companies like this. And I realized that if we were not able to backstop them with large amount of capital, mm -hmm. large amounts of capital once they were doing really well, um, that was going to be a big problem for what I wanted to see happen. Mm -hmm. That said, happy to go up against Sequoia in a traditional enterprise software business. We're not going to win all of those. Sequoia is not going to win every time. And that's just kind of how the market works. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a question or two, if anyone. Uh, Tim. Yeah. Um, so, Sam, you mentioned earlier that like a lot of the next uh, big interesting companies you see at YC right now around machine learning, bio, things like that. I was curious, have you seen like your founder demographic change from, say, 10 years ago, it's mostly web, and which doesn't require as much skill, as much industry experience, whereas now when you're tackling like these huge problems like planes, nuclear, um, so have you seen founders getting much older, or having much more industry experience before they do YC? Not much older, but a little bit. I think our average age has ticked up you know, two or three years over the last decade. Um, and there are many fields that require more training. Um, experience, I think, often cuts both ways. Sometimes it's really good, uh, and sometimes it, you know, I've heard many people that run very successful companies say, if I had experience, if I was not an idiot, I never would have started this. Um, and so there are different fields where it matters more or less. Um, we certainly have higher internal standards in, in different fields for how much experience and expertise we require. Um, on the other hand, uh, the counterbalancing factor to our average age is I am astonished at this point how many qualified, experienced 18-year-olds are starting companies. You know, people, there are 18-year-olds that have been programming for 10 years that could go get a job as a, you know, not entry-level engineer at any Silicon Valley tech company they wanted. And so you've seen that shift on the other side. Um, but overall, I think it's super field-dependent. You said that there, uh, there is a lot of money around, uh, but there's, I think there's also never <coughs> been as many startups as today. Uh, one uh, venture capital friend of mine was telling me that they get flooded with 20,000 applications <coughs> a year. They, they now do one in 4,000. So do you see this trend uh, continue like that, or do you, do you see a problem with that? And is isn't the money more concentrated in, into some of those companies and the rest have struggled to find money? I personally, at least from an economic point of view, I love the fact that there's as much company formation as there is. A part of the promise of the internet in my mind was to democratize the ability to start your own business. And not all of them need even get venture financing. The truth is that venture financing represents less than 1% of the new, form, new companies that are formed in the US every single year. Mm. Right? And so I, mean, I love the fact that I have friends from you know, Stanford who have started flourishing businesses that never required a, a penny of venture capital, and they're running it for themselves. And it's profitable, and they, you know, they have great businesses. And so I don't think it's 
for me to judge in general. I love the fact that there's that much ingenuity in entrepreneurship. Great. I think we have time for one more. Uh, both both and, uh, Sam, Outlook on China. You guys had a successful front so far, doing great. Generally, what's what's happening? What, what do you feel that that's going to happen in the next few years? I'll defer. To, I don't think I can meaningfully comment. Do you on. have a wife in East China, or have you thought? We've about thought about it. We don't have one today, and I don't. And I would. I am so far from someone qualified to weigh in on the outlook there that I don't even want to make a fool of myself. So no plans but to have one. But didn't you? Have we a might. We might. Some partner might go. Today? We we have okay. been um, looking at it more seriously, but we don't have a conclusion yet. I think part of the benefit of YC here is that it's a, a magnet for entrepreneurs from everywhere in the world. And China, you know, the sort of the, the rest of the world in China, it seems, <laughs> when it comes to the internet. And so it's, a, it's its own The YC its brand beast. in China is very Super strong. strong. I it mean, is I really strong. I was there in March, and I was at a Xinhua University, with one of the technical universities, and I, people were asking me about YC. Well, you know, it's demand. Yeah. There is demand. Um, <laughs> Well, there was an article that came out today from App Any Research that shows that the, um, the App Store business is now bigger in China than it is in the U.S., which, I mean, it's remarkable when you think about that. I think there's this, when you live in a country like the U U.S., you don't always appreciate the leapfrogging opportunities that exist outside. Mm -hmm. So I came from South Africa, and South Africa very quickly leapfrogged uh, mobile phones over landline telephones because the legacy infrastructure wasn't there, and so mobile phone adoption was unbelievable. I had better cell phone coverage in South Africa 15 years ago than I have today in the US. Um, and so similarly, it feels like China is leapfrogging, and you have all these consumers that are just embracing the internet, and they're not beholden to the past ways of shopping or doing business. You know, whether it's some of these, you know, the singles day sh uh, shopping mm -hmm. bonanza that's uh, around the corner, I think uh, very bullish on what's happening in China. They have the same issue that we have here with the, the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, really controlling a lot of the market. but. Um, Entrepreneurship is on fire, I think, in, that, in the country. It's unbelievable. Yeah, the biggest risk is really a macro risk in China. I mean, a lot of people are talking about, you know, is there a real estate bubble? 44% of the economy is tied to property development. What happens if that slows down? I mean, I think those are the bigger issues, but that's very separate, I think, from what happens sort of ground up inside startup land. So last question, for what advice do you have for entrepreneurs when, when it comes to fundraising? I mean, we talked a little about heed your unit economics, right? But what else are you telling people who knock on your door saying, you know, what do I do next in my fundraising strategy? What do I have to worry about? Well, for someone who's pitching us or someone who's an existing company looking for another round? Both. I actually usually respond to that with uh, the advice I'd give investors, which is you never have to invest. If you don't like the price of a company, if you don't think, if you think the entire market is overheated, mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to invest, but if, in a, if you think it's a good specific deal, you should still do it. And so the advice I give to companies is, because most of the questions people ask, most of the question companies ask about are, what's going on in the fundraising environment right now? How should I adapt my pitch for this particular fundraising environment? And, and my advice is, this is not about the fundraising market. This is about you as a specific company and convincing this investor that at the terms you want, or the, that this is a good risk-adjusted investment. And the answer to most founders' questions about how to hack fundraising is have a good company. And all of the effort that people put into fundraising jujitsu, I think would be better reallocated to making a really great company. And, and uh, I have seen this so many times where a founder puts all this effort into you know, telling their story and getting the company ready to fundraise and all of that and goes off and tries to raise money and can't raise any. And then um, somewhat dejected, figures out how to make it work with the money they have um, and gets the company looking like this, uh, profitable, growing, whatever, um, no longer needs money because they're profitable and growing. And then they have in the same investors that passed on them a year ago with really good reasons about, you know, deep insights about why the business wasn't going to work. Um, you know, desperate to invest. And so I think it's a little bit ridiculous to say, but the answer is make your company really good. Sounds good to me. Well, the the word that came to mind for me was authenticity. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, I mean, I remember when you came to present Loop many years ago. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if you had slides. Twelve years ago. <laughs> Did you even have slides? I can't remember if There's you no had. There's no way you had slides. Unlikely. Yeah. And 
you know, so people have this conception that you need to have these polished slides and you need to wear the right blazer or what, I mean, like, I definitely didn't have a blazer. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you didn't. And that's the point. It doesn't, it's, it's not what matters. You know, what's, what's engaging is you can sit down with the founder and have them explain their inspiration. What was the eureka moment that gave rise to this idea? And why is what they have a compelling solution to the problem? Uh, and really differentiate it mm. in, a, you know, in a sustainable way. That's what I look for. And having that conversation and dialogue is far more interesting than having my eyes glaze over with 25 slides and you know, a rehearsed pitch. Yeah. Authenticity. Sounds good. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.